presentation in life in a selfless way to help others? Um, I would think somebody who inspires like many people who can give people like uh, hope and dream maybe. I think somebody is a hero when they are somebody that you want to be like or when they make a change in your life for the better. Well, I think somebody's a hero if they go out of their way to help somebody else and they don't gain anything from it and they're doing out the kind of they are. Someone's a hero if they save other people. I think someone who's willing to help people who need help, who, I don't know, who don't necessarily have it all together and who are less fortunate. Reasons for why like, a hero is that is well, I feel like it's a social norm that people generally believe. You see heroes as some like, selfish figure, selfless figure, I mean. And like if it's selfless, then that would be putting others above themselves. I typically think of someone that's selfless as a hero, thinking of the greater good. Most people are kind of set to live their lives for themselves, and all of this most noble thing you can do in life is to just live for someone else. So I've seen a lot of selfish acts and I've seen a lot of selfish acts and I've seen that the way that a self, one single selfish act can affect somebody's whole day and I've seen that make just a big difference. been wondering a lot the last several days, does a genuine hero still exist? Is there any human being who still models greatness? In 2016, can a person be found who is worthy of respect and admiration? Do remarkable people still exist. In my opinion, Joseph was and is a hero. There is much about him that is worthy of imitation. Joseph modeled a life that anyone could see as great. And I love this. This is incredible. This sentence is powerful. Joseph is an ancient patriarch whose presence casts a sizable shadow across the colorful landscape of Hebrew history. Joseph's story occupies more space in the book of Genesis than any other single individual. More than Adam, more than Noah, more than Abraham, more than Isaac, and yes, even more than his own father, Jacob. Now folks, that is saying something. And as we look at the next several months, we are going to be studying and looking at and celebrating and gleaning from the great life of Joseph. I believe more than ever before that in our culture and in our world, we are in need of some modern day heroes. Some people that stick out like a sore thumb in a world full of fingers. And I, I believe, I'm praying, starting with myself, that the life of Joseph will jump off the page and inspire us to be better stewards, better disciples, better moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, better authentic followers of Jesus. And so today, we start at the very beginning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 37? And we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 3. I am going to have you stand for the reading of God's Word out of reverence. Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 3. Oh, that all of us would be called to live the life of a hero. That we would be worthy of respect 
and admiration, that we would be remarkable, that we would be great in regards to kingdom things. Oh, that's the life of Joseph. Oh, God, would you just pour out your presence amongst us in these next few minutes? Judge, Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 37, verses 1 through 3. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their fathers a bad report about them. Now, Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. And we'll stop right there. Let me pray for us. Father, would you please anoint my son off today? Hem me in with your presence, that your message would be heard by me and by all of us that you would open the eyes of our hearts so that we could truly see you and hear from you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The whole story starts with mom and dad. And we're going to expand it to grandma and grandpa. And we're going to extend it to uncles and aunts. But the whole deal starts there with Joseph's mom and dad. And I'm going to go ahead and just put the cart before the horse. I'm going to give you where we're going before we even get there. I want to inspire all of us, including myself today, to take a look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we living great lives for the kingdom for those who are younger, that are watching our every move and listening to our every word, here's the truth. It's nothing short of a miracle that Joseph turned out to be the man that he did in light of Jacob's um, poor decisions as a father. Parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts, oh, please hear this clearly today. In regards to in regard to decisions and leading those who come behind us, we must see how great our responsibilities are. And we've got to prayerfully succeed because our younger kinfolk are looking to us for a godly example. And the truth is, we have an advantage that Jacob did not have. We have God's Word. We have the precepts and the commands and the wisdom of God's holy book. There's no reason why any of us, moms, dads, grandmas and grandpas, uncles and aunts, there's no reason that any of us cannot live lives of success and greatness for the kingdom based on all that God has given us to live by. I don't know about you, but I want those who come behind me to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and celebrate the truth that God is on the throne all by himself. If that's your testimony today, say amen. amen. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, uncles and aunts, it's never too, this is so, this is so good because the devil would want some mom or dad or some grandma or grandpa or some uncle or aunt to think that you screwed up so bad 
that you'll never be able to fix it or get back on the right path. But the truth is, it's never too late to become who you might have been. Now, Grace Sunday School class was singing all about God's grace this morning at the end of class, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunts. Oh, maybe you've made a poor decision. Maybe you've goofed up along the way. Maybe you've done something that you regret. But the truth is, with God's grace and God's word and God's love and the greatness of your church family, it's never too late to become who you might have been. And I say hallelujah, amen, glory to his name. It's never too late to become the adult and the influencer that you might have been. In other words, no matter what you've done or what you've said in the past, it's just that, past. And starting today, all of us, all of us, you and I can move in a direction that will help our kids and our grandkids and our nieces and our nephews live successful lives for the kingdom. Hallelujah! God is good. Amen? Amen. I also want to add, I told you I was going to put the cart before the horse, and we're going to, we're going to get to where we're going, but I wanted to celebrate that truth first. But I also want to say this, no matter how old your kids get, we never stop parenting. Now the problem is, some parents think, well, I've raised my kids, I'm going to wash my hands. Well, there's one, raising our kids and continuing to parent them are two different deals. Raising our kids to be responsible adults and still parenting them can be done and must be done. I've got to tell you, my dad still parents me. And my guess is, Ron parents Mike, and the list goes on and on. I think we run a great danger and almost run into irresponsibility when we say, hey, I've raised them, I'm washing my hands. Well, you may have raised them, but parenting goes on till Jesus comes. Good preaching, Pastor Don. And so Jacob a.k.a. Israel and Rachel were Joseph's father and mother. Verse 3 tells us that Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Let's read that verse together. Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. One more time. Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. <coughs> it was that favoritism that caused an already dysfunctional family to be even more dysfunctional. And as a result of that favoritism, Joseph was chosen to be the head of the household upon Jacob's death. Well, how do we know that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Verse 3 tells us that Jacob gave Joseph an ornate robe, or a coat of many colors, or a multicolored tunic, depending on what version you're reading. But that robe was multicolored. It was ornate. It was celebration time. That robe... Is there something wrong with my mind? I'm sorry, Jason. Should I take it off, buddy? Is it acting up? I'll just take it off. How's that sound? That robe screamed, that robe screamed to the other 11 brothers, Father loves me more than he loves you. I'm more special than you are. Father loves me and he doesn't love you. Ha, 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 I've got a robe and you don't. I mean, it screamed favoritism. Look, Dad loves me more than he loves you. And in all actuality, and this is so fascinating, that multicolored, ornate robe literally refers to a shirt with long sleeves 
that reached to the hands and a long hem that reached to the ankles. Okay? A shirt with long sleeves and a long hem that reached to the ankles. Now follow me on this. That robe, that robe marked its wearer as a chieftain, as the head of a clan. The head of the household was Joseph going to be. He had absolute control over life and death. Of all the other family members around, that garment was worn by the head heir. When Jacob gave that robe to Joseph, it identified him as his father's choice to be his replacement. That role identified Joseph as the superior son of the family. That role told the other brothers, you don't report to Jacob anymore, you now report to me. When the brothers of Joseph saw him wearing that garment, they knew exactly where they stood in the pecking order within the family. By the way, that position also gave Joseph double the inheritance over all the other brothers. At the end of the day, Joseph's Joseph tunic, his cult, that favoritism would see him throw would see him thrown into a pit and sold off into slavery. And we'll get to that next Sunday. But here's where the parental issue raises its ugly head. Okay? We all know about the, the robe and the colors and, and all, what it signifies is very fascinating. But here's where the parental issues arise. Joseph was not the traditional choice to be the heir. Reuben was. Who was? Reuben was. Say that with me. Reuben was. Joseph was not the traditional choice to be the heir. Reuben was. Reuben was the firstborn uh, son of Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob by his first wife Leah. Okay? Reuben was the man who was supposed to be the next chieftain. However, because Reuben had committed incest and laid with Jacob's concubine. Bilhah, Reuben, would not have preeminence, okay? But what's bump-fuzzling is this. Jacob waited 12 chapters to go public with that information. Jacob waited until he was on his deathbed to clear up the confusion about who would be the head of the house. Of course, Joseph's brothers would be bumfuzzled by Joseph's role. Wait a minute. Joseph's not the firstborn of the first wife. Reuben is. What's going on? What's dad trying to say? He's passive. He's unconcerned. I don't get it. A 17-year-old prancing around in the midst of his 11 brothers, wearing the outward evidence of the future family chieftain without any word from the existing chief who was still alive and well, caused much confusion. And when you add that scenario to Jacob's mishandling of the rape of his daughter Dinah by Shechem, the son of Hamor, who was the mayor of the Hivites, and the murderous activities of his sons as a result of that rape, you can see that Jacob was a man who was too busy for his family, too preoccupied, too unconcerned, and far too passive. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, <coughs> uncles and aunts, I wonder if we ought to be the opposite of Jacob. I wonder if we ought to be not so busy. I wonder if we should make adequate time for our heritage. I wonder if we should be occupied, concerned, and anything but passive when it comes to giving example and
and direction to our younger kinfolk. I say it's high time for heroes to exist again. I say that the time is more, the time is more than right for someone to model spiritual greatness. I'm not sure that a time has ever existed when we need more people to be found worthy of respect and admiration. I'm talking about living godly lives in a perverse generation. If we want those who come behind us to live remarkable lives for the kingdom, we must lead in a remarkable way. Bums and dads, grandmas and grandpas, uncles and aunts, let us live lives that are worthy of imitation. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up. Say those three words with me. Bring them up. One more time. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now follow me here. That verse says fathers. Because in that culture that Paul was writing in, um, fathers were, were, it was all about the man. It was all about the father. It was all about the male figure. But as you dig into commentaries and ask Bible scholars, they will tell you the truth is this. It says fathers, but what the word is really trying to tell to us as adults, if you have influence over any younger mind or any younger heart or any impressionable soul, you must bring them up right with instruction and teachability, showing them what it looks like to be an authentic Christian who's on fire, who's passionate, not wishy-washy, living different from the world, sticking out like a sore thumb, loving your enemy, forgiving those who persecute you, understanding what it looks like to tithe, being able to be faithful on Sundays and Wednesdays when the church is open, we're there, we're in Sunday school, this is what it looks like, you're impressionable, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you, I'm the adult, you're the child, this is the way a Christian's supposed to live. Now again, in this society, it was all about men. And then children were only valuable most of the time if they were male. And I, I think I have it on the PowerPoint, and I may have even put it in your notes, but there was a letter written in 1 BC by a man named Hilarion to his wife, Alice. And here's what it says. Heartiest greetings. <laughs> Note that we are still even now in Alexandria. Do not worry if when all others return, I remain in Alexandria. I beg and beseech you to take care of the little child. And as soon as we receive wages, I will send them to you. If, good luck to you, you have another child, if it is a boy, let it live. If it's a girl, expose of it. Seneca, a renowned statesman in Rome at the time Paul wrote the Ephesian letter, said, We slaughter a fierce ox. We strangle a mad dog. We plunge a knife into a sick cow. Children born weak or deformed, we drown. Now, 
we read that and we say, oh, how terrible. We read that and say, oh, that's awful. What neglect. What abuse. Yet, according to a report that came out last month, the primary cause for children being in foster homes today is not divorce, and is not financial destitution, and it's not the death of their parents. The number one reason is disinterest on behalf of the parents. Perhaps the most devastating abuse of any child, grandchild, niece, or nephew, maybe the most devastating abuse of a child, grandchild, niece, or nephew is that of being neglected, being treated like he or she does not exist. Well, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunts, I got good news for you, you today. Our kids, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, hallelujah, they exist. But God has given us a command to follow, to bring them on. Not ignore them and wish them the best.
Secondly, there must be instruction. And you can take this word all the way back, and it means teaching by words. Teaching by words. Adults. If you're an adult, raise your hand. <laughs> or if you're an adult wannabe, raise your hand. There you go. Adults who desire to influence blood relations of any age do so by means of positive words, godly words, not to mention the tone of our words. My guess is, Michael, that Jackson knows the difference between come here, Jackson, versus come here, Jackson. Right? Uh-huh. Now, folks, I was so convicted by this, and I'm not a grandpa yet, but when I am, someday, we're going to do better than what we did maybe with our kids. But in our day, far too many adults use the television and video games as babysitters because they do not want to deal with their younger kinfolk. They don't want to bring them up, they just want to ignore them and hope for the best. And so as a result, children learn to interact with others verbally by what they hear on Spongebob, King of the Hill, married with children. Now, do any of us want Al Bundy teaching our kids how to talk to women? Hannah Montana, the Simpsons, the days of our lives, like sands to the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Na, 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 na. No, I'm sorry. Madden 2016 <coughs> and Call of Duty. And, and as I read that, like, that makes sense to me. The verbiage of kids and teenagers. And we say, surely you didn't hear that in, in, by, from your mom. Yeah, no, I heard it on Call of, Call of Duty, baby. I shot 55 commies and 16 widows and 100 kids in five minutes. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunts, we're responsible for what our children hear, what they hear. It's up to us to be sure that they're hearing words that strengthen their relationship with God and show them how to work and play well with others. And adults, may our words be filled with God's Word. But that's not possible unless we know what God's Word says. A six-year-old grandson, his name was Brady. He rarely made it to Sunday school, and he was sick one day, complaining that he had a slight stomach ache. His lack of biblical knowledge 